So we have 10 minutes, as uh, uh, Henning told us. So allow me uh, briefly to start my keynote on the practice of humanitarian intervention in the 19th century with a quote, which I came along during my research on the history of humanitarian intervention. I quote, when a government, though acting within the limits of, of its sovereign rights, violates the rights of humanity, be it by measures contrary to the interest of other states, or be it by excesses of injustice and cruelty, which are deeply wounding to our manners of our civilization, the right of intervention is lawful. For, however worthy of respect the rights of sovereignty and the independence of states, maybe there's something worthier of greater respect still, and that is the right of humanity. Or, of human society which must not be insulted. Just as within the state, the freedom of the individual is restrained and must be restrained by law. So the individual freedom of states must be limited by the law of human society." End of quote. I would say this is quite a remarkable statement, especially if we think about the fact that is not a statement made at the end of the 20th century, but one made 100 years earlier at the end of the 19th century. During the Great, Great Eastern Crisis of 1875 to 1878, and after the Russian declaration of war against the Ottoman Empire, the German legal scholar, Egidius Arns, so maybe here we can say that there are some German scholars working on humanitarian intervention and R2P earlier, not in the 20th or 21st century. Egidius Ernst argued in this way, limiting or even subordinating sovereignty to the law of humanity. Thus, he delivered one of the first legal definitions of humanitarian intervention, which was supported by the prominent tourists of his time. And I think it connects very nicely to what Henning said in his uh, introduction, about the idea of what is sovereignty and how is the relation to the laws of humanity. So recent historical scholarship has shown that the concept and practices of humanitarian intervention did not just appear suddenly out of the blue in the 1990s, but is much older and has a long, complex history. It was the struggle against the international slave trade in the early 19th century, which established the notion of military intervention for the protection and enforcement of humanitarian norms in international politics. Efforts to implement an international ban on the slave trade by force created a set of precedents which would go on decisively to influence public opinion, politics, and international law far beyond the original abolitionist cause, namely in the already mentioned context of the Eastern question and European intervention in the Ottoman Empire to protect Christian minorities. According to Arns and his legal colleagues of the 19th century, to mention Gustave Roland Chagrin or Johann Kaspar Blunchley, other legal colleagues who supported Arns' views, in the, in the view of this uh, legal colleagues of the 19th century, the protection from slavery and religious oppression were the two causes justifying humanitarian intervention and the reason to establish the notion and the doctrine in international law. So the concept and practices of humanitarian intervention does have indeed a long and rich history. But how does this history matter regarding today's discussion of R2P and to use military force to protect human rights? So directly link it to the topic of our symposium. Let me briefly outline two positions in dealing with this history in the context of two days R2P discussion, one of historical amnesia and one that is overstretching the history of humanitarian intervention as a direct guideline for two days human rights politics. On the one side, to give you a very prominent example for historical amnesia, the scholarly supplementary volume to the report of the ICISS, the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, we talked about it yesterday, produced as part of the R2P project in weighing in over at 400 pages, 
cites the historical development from the 19th century only very briefly. And it's, it's excellent, half page. And hence leaves very little, if any at all, room for historical context. As a result, the genealogy outlined here views humanitarian intervention above all as a very recent invention and denies the existence of a long history of the idea of protecting humanitarian norms by force. Some authors, like Gareth Evans, former Australian foreign minister and co-chair of the ICISS, even characterized the 400 years from the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 to the Holocaust as a time of, quote, institutionalized indifference, in which very few examples of state intervention into foreign territory can be said to have occurred for humanitarian purposes. As a historian, you can understand that this gives, some, gives you some troubles to call 400 years as an institutional indifference regarding humanity and the wars or the laws of humanity. So on the other side, to present you the other extreme position, some scholars pay very much attention to the long history of humanitarian intervention and treat the historical example as constituting a guide or even a lesson learned in political decision making and human rights politics today. For instance, Gary Bass is arguing in his book Freedom's Battle, a study of European intervention in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century that, I quote, 19th century shows how the practice of humanitarian intervention can be managed, end of quote. Additionally, people like Brenton Sims and David Trim put forward histori historians put forward the argument that due to the frequency of this early humanitarian intervention against the slave trade and for the protection of Christian minorities, I quote, human rights emerged as a term and legal concept in the mid 19th century, end of quote. To be clear, I disagree with both positions. It's not surprising that I disagree with the historical amnesia one as a, historical, as a historian, but I also disagree with the guideline one. I do so because both completely ignore a fundamental part of the history of humanitarian intervention in the 19th century. Namely, that it was integral part of colonial and imperial practices. Intervening against the African slave trade and protecting Christian minorities in the name of common humanity reveals most vividly the close and infamous entanglement of European humanitarianism with 19th century colonialism and imperialism. Abolishing the slave trade in the name of humanity was an effective instrument for legitimizing colonial and imperial conquest in Africa, as much as Christian minority protection served as a tool of repeated European interference in the Ottoman Empire. Even though the historical precedence of humanitarian intervention contributed significantly to the emergence of humanitarian norms in international law, as I tried to show in my introduction and quote of Egidius Arns, this was not tantamount to the rise of human rights concepts in a modern sense. Abolitionists could passionately fight against the transatlantic slave trade and demand military intervention against this violation of a common sense humanity, but at the same time endorse the paternalistic concept of a mission to civilize the Africans without granting them equal rights. Even though the idea of protecting humanitarian norms by force established in the long 19th century, this was not synonymous with the idea of protecting human rights according to the principles of equality and universality, which actually happened in the 20th century. In my opinion, those to ignore or to treat these historical examples as guideline for today's action leads in the wrong direction. I rather argue that seriously dealing with this history ought to sharpen our views of the danger of military intervention under the banner of humanity collapsing with colonial and imperial projects and all that may follow from it. A deep historical perspective on the ambivalent phenomenon of humanitarian intervention and its revealing imperial links is in my opinion indispensable to the development of viable concepts for international protection of human rights. Not least to sharpen our own awareness here in Europe 
and perception of regions in Africa, Asia, and the Americas that in the past have experienced Western interventions. With this in mind, it should come not as a little surprise that countries of the so-called Global South, with colonial experience of their own, like South Africa, Brazil, and India, should be highly skeptical or critical of the concept of R2P. As the history of humanitarian intervention was so closely linked to European colonialism and imperialism, we should be aware of this infamous, infamous connection and not so simply forget this history, as done in the RTP, supplementary war, or uncritically regard it as a guideline for today's action. Thank you very much. very much uh, for having me here. It's uh, an ideal opportunity to present some of the thinking in uh, the new book that just has been mentioned. My task here is to yeah, present uh, the German case and I will use this German case also to try to draw out some of the kind of fundamental positions and some of the fundamental narratives behind the justification or, or the connection between uh, an international responsibility and uh, intervention, in particular military intervention. I also have a, a, a kind of small presentation because at the end I have a picture that visualizes the different positions a little bit better. So uh, yesterday we heard that the cons cosmopolitan Responsibility is a, a construct um, which uh, is undoubtedly uh, true. And once uh, uh, this cosmopolitan responsibility comes to a point where it's actually uh, put into a reality, um, uh, there is a, there's the, always the question uh, arises and debates start about whose responsibility it is and towards whom this responsibility should actually uh, should actually extend and how far it should actually go. So this uh, always involves the construction of a kind of imagined community which can be humanity but once you're at the level of talking about sending your national troops there it's usually your national uh, community so this imagined community has a responsibility towards others and uh, a responsibility to such an degree that it justifies uh, different measures of intervention uh, and uh, with the most radical being, um, being military intervention. So uh, this, this responsibility is, is framed differently in different countries and as we heard also differently at different points in time throughout history. So in the US case, uh, uh, it's, it's always, or yeah, th throughout the history of, of American military intervention, the, the terms of duty and mission come up over and over again. So a, a mission that the American people have towards, towards the world. In the French case, uh, often it's the word vocation, uh, which the French have to extend uh, towards the world. And in Germany, it's uh, uh, it's term for Antwortung that shows up over and over again. And hence, hence I, I, I uh, called my chapter on Germany actually um, uh, for Antwortungsrepublik because uh, on this term responsibility for Antwortung, this this was actually you can show uh, the debates on this question: whose responsibility towards whom? Uh, it should extend how it was discussed throughout uh, throughout German uh, post-war history, uh, and um, so uh, there were there were uh, throughout uh, this period of post-war history there were always contested narratives and that constructed certain notions of us versus. Uh, them and they distinguish themselves always with respect to whom this responsibility actually should apply. So if you look at the, at the, at the German post-war history, 
uh, you saw that it was shaped very much by an inward-looking uh, inward identity. So when talking about some kinds of international responsibility or something like this, the German debate was basically about protecting their own security. And uh, the military uh, that was built up and so on, that was actually basically for protecting Germany itself. As soon as debates came up about you know, whether we should help the Americans in Vietnam and, or, or, or do something else internationally, this was usually blocked off um, uh, for a long time. Only after yes, the, the, the reconstruction uh, went on and the economic rise, debates started about whether Germany not only had a responsibility towards itself, but also towards others. So um, these debates uh, encompassed first like measures like foreign aid and, and, and other diplomatic support, weapons deliveries, but military inter intervention was, or something like this, sending troops abroad, that, that, was, that, that was absolutely out of the question. But in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, as, as uh, Germany became more like prominent, uh, more and more prominent member of the, the Western Alliance and also member of the United Nations, debate started on whether this membership of Germany in the Western Alliance as part of the West would not, or as part of the United Nations, would not involve like uh, also taking on some of the duties or as on the responsibilities that the West or the United Nations formulated for itself. So um, formulations of, of, of Germany as a as partner in the alliance, as, a, as part of the West, uh, and as the West was taking on humanitarian and other responsibilities of collective securities, the question became whether Germany should not should not take part in it. And this was always a really contested question after 1989, but basically Germany was shielded by the Cold War from really coming to terms with this uh, question of international responsibility. Uh, but after 1989, these questions really uh, took on um, uh, a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, uh, historical and, and also political uh, immediacy. And, um, and you could see that after 1989, German uh, debates started to reframe their lessons from the past that were mostly formulated as the necessity to protect ourselves or to prevent wars uh, towards uh, a lesson uh, that said that Germans, German history was actually um, telling us to, to prevent atrocities instead of wars. So there was this kind of really hard debate between uh, different groups in society that actually uh, uh, talked about how the, the same past should be inter interpreted in completely different ways. And you could see this encapsulated in the debates within the Green Party, for example. And these, uh, these, different, uh, these different debates that, that are not only in Germany, uh, also in other intervention debates, there's always references to, to uh, a country's own past in France and so on. What does it mean for our international responsibility? But in Germany, this, this became particularly clear. And I've listed up the, the, the different debates or positions of debates here on this table. Um, uh, you can leave out the analogies that was for another paper on historical analogies. But you could uh, see that then four kind of basic camps, four basic groups of discussions formed along like two um, dividing lines between a cosmopolitan and a more communitarian line, the communitarian line uh, being the position that uh, says that responsibility extends mostly towards your own community, not towards others, and the cosmopolitan saying that responsibility also extends 
towards others. And there's another dividing line between what I call right and left, more or less, which gives you basically four groups. So maybe the first and dominant one in German post-war history was the supporting the cosmopolitan support intervention camp on the more or less right that argued, okay, we are part of a certain alliance of certain group, be it the West or in the past decades, mostly the EU. And as part of this alliance, we formulate certain goals, certain responsibilities towards the international arena or towards our near abroad that also obliges us to send troops, for example, uh, to Mali or to Afghanistan and so on. On the left, you have the, like, the, the humanitarian cosmopolitan camp that says that uh, responsibility should extend towards everybody, every human being, uh, and that Germany should take up this responsibility. And this is the kind of uh, motivating factor for supporting, like in the Green Party, there's a very strong um, group, and Annalena Baerbock is an ex a typical exponent of this position that, that, that Germany has a responsibility towards persecuted others wherever they are, uh, and it, it's not like mainly part of our alliance duty or something like this. On the other hand, you have the anti-interventionist camp, uh, and you have on the extreme end the ethnic nationalists that basically say, okay, the responsibility of a particular group uh, defined ethnically in extreme, that's the Alternative for Deutschland, AFD position, we have only a responsibility towards Germans. What the others, uh, that, that doesn't concern or concerns us, but that our main responsibility is towards us. Um, less extreme position would be the nationalist position that says, okay, uh, a country has its has to pursue its national interests. It has to be uh, focused on its own particular interests. If other problems in the world occur or are, are, uh, are in line with these national interests, OK, we can go along. But basically, um, we have to pursue this position. And then you have a, a, a more left wing position that has been less represented in the debate, but now there's actually a new party on it uh, with Sarah Wagenknecht. That's the national pacifist, as I might call, group that basically argues, okay, if you, if you go abroad, if you intervene abroad, if you uh, uh, yeah, have a lot of commitments abroad, even sending a lot of money abroad and so on, this uh, uh, is disadvantageous for the poor for the disadvantaged in our own society, or this changes something in the balance of our own society, militarizes us or whatever, and draws the resources away from the problems that we actually have. So the focus is less on national interest, but on the, the interests of, let's say, what they uh, think are the disadvantaged in their own society. So this is more kind of a left-wing position that is as critical of military intervention as is the right-wing position. And as I said yesterday in uh, several discussions, that's where actually the different groups that are usually on the very much opposing end of the, uh, of the political spectrum actually meet in this question of military intervention. So these are actually these are, these are, this is the outline, basically, of the German debate. And I think you find it similarly in, in other countries. In each of these groups, you find this particular construction of what's the, what the V group is that, that should act and what the relation of this V group is towards others. And uh, the intensity of the debates on military intervention are explained by the presence of these different like very deeply ingrained identity constructions that conflict with each other. And um, uh, well, just to conclude, uh, given that you have these kind of different groups and ideas in, uh, in practically all 
countries or alliances that debate about military intervention, I think uh, it, it is uh, uh, yeah, relatively unrealistic to expect a, a kind of common, uh, common international responsibility that really uh, is effective because uh, when you come to the actual action, you always have to go back to the kind of units that really can do something, and these are the nation states, and, you, and then you're into this uh, debate, and that makes, makes it so, so difficult. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, please bear with me uh, while we go back a little bit to the conceptual side of things. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are experts on these concepts, um, but I want to try to present also some broader arguments if we think about conceptually about RTP and humanitarian intervention. And one of the main arguments is even while we grasp for concepts, we have to understand the whole um, endeavor as a process, always as a process. Also, the concepts are in constant evolvement and transformation. So I will um, talk about humanitarian intervention definitions in R2P, uh, a little bit about the well-known International Commission uh, concept of R2P, World Summit, and beyond what I want to term here the R2P assemblage, um, which are we also we are also part of this assemblage, by the way. What I mean with that is the conceptual work, the different agents that come together, the different processes that constantly uh, retransform these uh, understandings of intervention in R2P and some closing arguments. So if you look into um, the uh, trying to find clear definitions of humanitarian interventions, of course you won't be able to. There is no consensus about what a humanitarian intervention in the end is. You have the classical narrow definitions of a state intervening uh, uh, in another state to protect own or other citizens or a group of states, etc. Wider understandings, which tends to be a little bit more modern, uh, in a sense, uh, emerging also very strongly in the 90s, where humanitarian intervention has the strong humanitarian aspect, emergency assistance, etc. And this is also one of the starting points of the debate of R2P, of course. Um, not the military side, but also the humanitarian assistance side and protection of civilian side. But Literature always urges us to remember that humanitarian interventions and interventions decisions are political. We won't get out of this, and we discussed it uh, yesterday. It always comes up. The decision in the end, it's not necessarily a legal procedure only. It is always a political uh, procedure um, in this uh, assembly, as I want to call it. And then with, but why the, of course, and it's important for us, if we think about this, why are we so much focused on concepts? Why are we focused on finding these namings and definitions? Because we have next to this political uh, process also legal dimensions. And as Mandani um, uh, argues, um, and when we bring in then the international criminal procedures, also even to not only talk about responsibility to protect, the right to intervene, but also even a right to punish emerges in this whole complexity of the discussion on R2P. So a, a look um, on the core principles of the Commission, um, uh, published in 2001, the Commission itself, um, uh, uh, sponsored by the Canadian government starting in 2000, of course. And we will see with the basic principles um, it always starts with the state. Um, R2P is very much concerned with domestic issues. Uh, and then there is a point where it uh, um, em em emerges also in the international realm. And the three elements to prevent, the responsibility to react, um, the responsibility to rebuild, as in, uh, Alexander also mentioned it yesterday in our discussion, this point, um, uh, gets lost, gets gets lost a little bit in the following discussion. Um, so what happens 
after interventions, what happened, uh, happens after humanitarian assistance, what happens after these mass violence and grave violations. Um, in the next step, as I said, the responsibility to rebuild uh, is, is, is gone. We are now World Summit 2005. Um, there's, there are these three paragraphs. I decided against putting it here because it's so much text. But basically, between 2005 and 2009, in many, many papers, meetings, strategy, development, um, three core pillars emerge uh, uh, on this concept of R2P. The first one, again, brings us to the state, to the domestic realm. Um, with every state has the responsibility. Pillar two, very interesting, to support and, um, uh, uh, and assist in meeting that responsibility. And we heard it yesterday that most of the work also of your center, for example, is concerned with this element. And then in pillar three, the international um, uh, community and also potentially violence emerges. So do not be shocked about the next slide because um, I wanted to show you from a conceptual point of view what the UN itself puts in these, coming from these pillars in the policies and, and how broad conceptuals that are <coughs> surrounding R2P actually are. You don't have to read all of these things, but pillar one and pillar two, still the domestic realm, so pillar two in international assistance to the domestic realm, you can see what is in the in pillar two, for example, transitional justice in the mid part. This is a massive endeavor by itself. Uh, in pillar one, security sector, um, working with police um, uh, and law enforcement, etc. These are massive endeavors, mostly concerned uh, uh, with the inner uh, realm of states and domestic realm. And then in pillar three, you can also see all these different policy tools and strategies um, supported by UN agencies that are emerging uh, around or from this concept. So, um, a very, very broad, a very broad endeavor. So, the R2P assemblage. So, what we see after 2005 and then again after 2009, where is this conceptual transformation, permanent reformulation, discussing happening? Mostly, and this is what I call the assemblage of R2P. So we have, of course, UN agencies involved. We have the Secretary General involved with reports. We have over 140 UN resolutions from different bodies. Um, coming back to R2P, mentioning R2P to various degrees, Security Council, General Assembly, Human Rights Commission. We have initiative in member states, regional organizations. We have the policy world, your center and others, and of course academia. And it is uh, important, and we heard it also yesterday, it's still a relatively young process. Um, so um, somewhere in this assemblage, and somewhere in a back and forth, uh, and if you think about the member states, of course, like uh, member states of UN, uh, sheer number, uh, more critical states, more states that are more positive towards RTP and intervention are working together in keeping this um, uh, uh, concept um, on the table. We can also see, and this I found extremely interesting, if you look on the website of the, of the advisor of R2P, it's like a dialogue with critics. So there is a constant attempt of having an a interpretative authority of what is R2P. Is it a Western concept? Is a question, is it a Western concept? And then the advisor answers you, no, it's not a Western concept, gives you some, some background. Is it about military? No, it's not about military. And the, the mistake that happened was Libya. That's the problem we're still dealing with. So even in the UN institution, you can see how as a constant attempt of interpret and, and, and um, uh, define what R2P is and what it isn't. Some arguments in the end, referring to the conceptual elements, but also to the practice, which is also part of our, um, uh, of our uh, discussions uh, this morning. So R2P is one concept of humanitarian intervention, but it will also always coexist with other forms of humanitarian intervention. While historically embedded in a particular period, of course, offers substantial reference points in global discourse and governance. 
So going away from something strict as, a, as an opportunity to refer to violence against civilians, mass atrocities, R2P has established itself, actually, with a focus on prevention of violence and with a focus on the internal sphere, the domestic sphere of states. But there are no automatisms. So I would suggest that we understand <coughs> RTP more as an opportunity structure. As, and it is frustrating, of course, uh, if you look why RTP is existing, uh, uh, prevention of mass atrocities. Um, so it's not a very legal argument. But from a political understanding, it, is more, it seems more to be an opportunity structure to refer to. And you can also refer to um, if, you're actually, if your own actions are... Um, very different. If you look at how the uh, coalition in, in, in Yemen, uh, Saudi Arabia-led coalition in Yemen argues, it's also, you find a lot of references to responsibility to protect, etc., humanitarian references. But you can see how powerful this as a discursive reference point R2P is. And this leads back to politics and power in the, in the, uh, in the realm of decision-making. Um, so um, while at times frustrating, if you look uh, in, in some of the literature um, uh, existing, um, I'm, 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 I'm often coming back to Walling and her study on in humanitarian intervention in the 1990s in the Security Council, where she very clearly shows that um, states narrate stories about which norms at a specific point in time are more important in which kind of conflicts. So most of the time, state sovereignty and non-intervention always trumps, even in the 90s with this height of international intervention. Mostly trumps the, the discussion. But sometimes a story emerges, and then you need reference points like R2P, where the, um, uh, uh, the, the sovereignty understanding is balanced out by other narratives. And then something like R2P comes in and um, is quite important. Walling is not talking about R2P, about humanitarian intervention, but I guess it will be the same logic. Alexander Reichmann has prepared some questions. We are looking forward to discussing uh, with you in the World Cafe uh, later, uh, digging more into concepts of humanitarian intervention at R2P. Thank you so much. Thanks so much to every one of you. Um, thanks so much for the invitation to this interesting event. And uh, thanks also especially for allowing me to zoom in due to uh, illness. Of course, I would have loved to be with you today, but it's great that I can at least join you virtually. All right. So let's move on to the topic of my uh, short input. It's the misuse or abuse of humanitarian interventions and I would like to start with the question what does it actually mean when we talk about uh, humanitarian intervention being abused so first of all it is uh, quite obvious I'd say that we mean with um, an abuse of humanitarian intervention that a proposed um, other than the supposedly humanitarian one is being carried out in a military intervention. In other words, um, an intervention is not at least primarily carried out to protect human rights, but for primarily power political reasons, for instance. In practice, of course, this is not easy to prove because we know from research that humanitarian interventions are actually mostly based on a mixture, a combination of motives, a combination of arguments, of humanitarian motives, of non-humanitarian motives. And uh, for instance, in the context of the <clears throat> uh, intervention or the, the, the um, genocide in Rwanda of 1994, US President Bill Clinton even rejected directly an intervention on the grounds that he argued that the US public 
um, or, or US um, uh, politics cannot intervene wherever um, US public has some sensitivity. So that was actually uh, quite direct uh, reference that where no, no political or military interests are at all, it's quite difficult to argue in favor of an intervention in some cases. In the case of uh, NATO interven intervention in Kosovo, uh, as all of you know, Jürgen Habermas wrote um, that it was a war between morality and law. And one could, of course, add that it was also a war between morality, law, and politics. So first of all, when we speak of abuse of humanitarian intervention, we mean an intervention in which the humanitarian reasons appear to be purely pretextual and the power political motives are so clearly predominant that they cannot pass what Thomas Frank went once called the so-called love test. So this is an argument which is so obviously in contradiction to international law that it makes you actually laugh. And one example might be Russia's attempt right now to justify its war of aggression in Ukraine by referring to genocide in Luhansk and Donetsk. So that may be one case which falls clearly into this love test uh, argument of Thomas Frank. A second perspective um, to, to talk about another example of abuse of humanitarian intervention could be exceeding the mandate. So a typical example, and we've already heard about that, is in recent history, of course, the Libya intervention of 2011. We had a UN resolution 1973. However, this ultimately ended in a regime change uh, and, uh, you know, Gaddafi's regime ended violently, uh, his life ended. And so in this case, we can quite clearly talk about the abuse or in any case, the exceeding of the mandate of an intervention. Now, um, one aspect um, of the abuses of humanitarian intervention that um, particularly interests me in my own research is a closer look at the role of violent interventions and its justification. Also, and um, Henning has pointed to that in the longer development of modern international law. So humanitarian intervention plays a special role in this, as we've already heard. And my basic argument here would be that uh, humanitarian intervention can also be understood as an discursive arena in which the significance and also the authority of international law is contested over and over again. So we could argue that the humanitarian intervention as a political topic is actually also a struggle for international law. Yeah, why is this the case, you might ask? And uh, my answer is that, and we've already heard it um, in, in uh, Werner Distler's talk right now, that of course, humanitarian intervention is a particularly poorly normed policy field. So even in the case of the responsibility to protect, uh, there's still debate as whether this is actually a legal norm or, and I find this more uh, convincing, it is rather an emerging norm, it is more like a political norm. And uh, I also understood Werner Distler that he agrees in this point. So um, at the same time, and this is also because it is so political, the humanitarian intervention is particularly debated in the political field, but also in the legal field. And this is particularly discussed on the basis of precedents. So earlier cases, which then are brought up again to construct the normative argument. And I would like to really shortly the view on the time uh, to illustrate this with two cases. Um, uh, we have already heard from uh, Fabian Klose that the 19th century can be 
understood as the golden golden century of humanitarian intervention. So as Fabian Klose argues, or, originating in the context of the uh, abolitionism, so uh, slave trade prohibition, it became then particularly significant in Europe in the context of the Eastern or Oriental question. What I find now quite interesting from a perspective of the politics of international law as a historical perspective um, is, and I've tried to analyze this in my upcoming book, is that we also have in the context of the third piece um, of Paris of 1856, after the Crimean War, we see actually an interesting but sometimes overlooked legalization of violence and also a partial prohibition of intervention, at least in the territory of the Ottoman Empire under international treaty law, which is quite interesting as a historical um, case. Now, now, the fact is that this uh, prohibition was linked to the, um, <coughs> however, voluntary um, guarantee of the Sultan, uh, Ottoman Sultan, to take care of the uh, Christian subjects in his empire. And you could uh, actually argue that this is, in a sense, the crux of the matter, because this norm was obviously also politically directed against Russia, which had uh, immediately before been defeated in the Crimean War by the alliance of France, Great Britain, and Sardinia Piemont. Um, so in other words, my argument is that in the middle of the 19th century, we already had a norm of intervention that prohibited the use of force to protect Christians, at least without the authority of the European Council, uh, the European Concert. So um, it is now quite interesting to, to see how this norm could be misused or abused. So in 1877, and Fabian Klose also talked about it already um, in the context of the Great Balkan crisis, Russia used this um, guarantee of the Ottomans I just talked about um, to protect uh, the, the subjects, uh, the Christian subjects in the Ottoman Empire. Russia used this guarantee now to argue in favor of a um, humanitarian intervention. And in doing so, Russia was able in the end, because it uh, defeated um, the Ottoman Empire, then it was able to base its arguments first of all, on the Ottoman massacres in Bulgaria in 1876. And um, what is important here that these massacres led to an outcry in the Euro European public and particularly in Great Britain. So the end of this conflict was that Russia succeeded in uh, standardizing now a right to intervene in the Ottoman Empire at the Berlin Conference of 1878. And this means that the debate about humanitarian intervention, the norms on humanitarian interventions could be used to turn the positive law of 1856 directly on its head. So we see these effects uh, in history also in the more recent present times. We, of course, and you talked about it yesterday, we have a <coughs> we have a prohibition on the use of force and a ban on intervention in the Charter of the United Nations, and even today we can state that humanitarian interventions without a mandate from the Security Council are, of course, contrary to international law. Then came Kosovo. Uh, Kosovo intervention, NATO intervention 1999, when humanitarian justifications gave rise to the idea in the West, Western discourse, particularly the German discourse also, that this might not be illegal, to quote Bruno Zimmer, the lawyer, but that it was at least legitimate. And um, Hubert Zimmermann has already pointed to some of the debates in Germany, which um, is quite interesting also to, to see these different uh, perspectives. Um, now, from the, from the perspective of international law, however, this case is now 
particularly interesting because it is often also seen as a precedent, precedence file, precedent case, um, which in turn makes abuse of humanitarian intervention possible, or at least opens this uh, window of opportunity to discuss again the basics of international relations, as Stanley Hoffman has once argued. So the debate, and we just heard it uh, from Bernard Distler, but the R2P has also been prompted by this intervention. Um, and also the legal debate surrounding the cause of intervention is of course still with us today. And this leads me shortly to uh, the context of the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine again. So there's also the question whether humanitarian reasons can justify violence. These questions have been debated in the political arena. But now, and this is quite interesting, I think they are also debated in the legal arena. Of course, you can't really separate between the two on the international level, but still, of course, there are different forums and arenas. So in March 2022, the International Court of Justice ordered an immediate end to Russian violence in Ukraine as a part of urgent uh, proceedings. And right now there is we have an Ukrainian lawsuit against Russia before the International Court of Justice, which concerns the Russian justification for war that Ukraine had, to follow the Russian arguments, committed genocide in Luhansk and Donetsk. And of course, Ukraine wants uh, the International Court of Justice to declare this, of course, invented justification for war null and void. Um, and actually, this leads us now to a discussion on the Genocide Convention before the International Court of Justice, uh, based on Russians', Russians claim to protect human rights in eastern Ukraine. Um, and at least in the political arena, uh, as you all know, of course, one of the most important points of reference for the Russian argument has always been NATO intervention in Kosovo. So Russia argues if the West can do it, so can we. Yeah, um, needless to say, perhaps this uh, case, we can, of course, in this case, we can see uh, particularly clearly that the Russian arguments cannot meet Thomas Frank's uh, criteria and they fall under this love test argument of Frank. However, they also point to the fact that the humanitarian intervention is still really poorly standardized, normatized, um, which makes this justification particularly susceptible to interpretation and abuse. And the legal dispute also points to the fact that there has not been really a turning point where this emerging norm has become international law, in my opinion. So I come to my conclusion. Um, humanitarian intervention, we've heard that um, already, has always been uh, seen as an important topic in uh, modernity, at least since the 19th century, in an analogical way, it could even go back further to early modernity, protection of foreign uh, citizens, so to say. Um, but now, my argument would be that humanitarian intervention has also always been discussed as a catalyst for international legalization of the emergence of international law in the dualism, what Lothar Pock calls the dualism of state law and human rights law on the international level. So, Again, with regard to the NATO intervention in Kosovo, Jürgen Habermas argued 20 years ago that the NATO intervention could be understood actually as a morally legitimate anticipation of a cosmopolitan legal order in the sense of Immanuel Kant and his perpetual peace of 1795. This was perhaps a kind of, um, yeah, you could say sympathetic, but in my opinion, also quite bold hope. Um, and this can perhaps be seen in the quote from another author, 
um, a legal scholar who wrote, perhaps the theory of humanitarian intervention can be seen as a sign of an emerging doctrine and a new conception of the international community in which nations closely united and interdependent are organized under one authority or at least under a hierarchical power charged with guaranteeing respect for justice. So this letter quote is not from 1999, but it's actually from 1910. It's from the international legal scholar Antoine Roger from France. And also the international German international lawyer Franz von Liszt warned in 1898 that the acceptance of justifications for interventions based on natural law, morality, ethics, um, and with this bypassing positive treaty law would actually open the floodgates to national arbitrariness. So in short, not only the debate on humanitarian intervention, but also the debate on the abuse of humanitarian intervention is not new at all. Um, the fact that it has not been resolved today highlights the need for further debate on this dilemma and it also highlights the importance of this symposium. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.